Around the world, countless millions suffer with diseases that could be easily cured if those patients could only reach modern medical care. For a fortunate few, there is a lifeline called Africa Mercy. As we first told you in February, she is the largest civilian hospital ship on the seas, but she's also the closest thing to a time machine you're ever likely to see. Her largely American crew brings 21st century medicine to people who believe that illnesses are caused by evil spirits. The patient's beliefs may seem archaic, but their courage is to be admired. They suffer from diseases unseen in America, illnesses that can make you believe in curses. Spend a few days as we did aboard the Africa Mercy, and you will see how two worlds meet at the intersection of courage and compassion. The story will continue in a moment. She can be described in the usual dimensions of a ship, 500 feet in length, eight decks, a crew of 450. Or you can reckon Africa Mercy as a hospital, 90 nurses, 15 doctors, 78 beds, and six operating rooms. Good, okay. One of the first doctors who invited us into surgery was Gary Parker, a maxillofacial surgeon who came to the ship on a lark. And I remember saying to myself, when I get opportunity, I want to come maybe for a few months and just see what this is about, see if I'm cut out of the right fabric for that kind of life. And how long have you been here? Uh, 26 years. You'll understand why he stayed when you see the ship at work as we did in Togo, West Africa. A lot of ways here haven't changed in centuries. Most live on $2 a day. There are few medical facilities. When the ship comes in, folks line up by the thousands for free dental surgery, eye surgery, and maxillofacial procedures for cleft palates and other deformities. Africa Mercy makes port in countries all along the arc of West Africa, 1,800 miles where slave ships used to land. Trace that coastline and you've put your finger on several of the poorest countries on Earth. Here in Togo, the lack of development and the poverty mean that one out of 10 children, one out of 10, dies before the age of five. They die of diseases that we just don't see in the United States, including a particular kind of facial tumor that is a specialty of the ship. What you're about to see can be very hard to look at, but if you'll be patient, it'll be worth it. Gary Parker is the chief surgeon. Hello. And one of his patients, Ito, was back for a checkup 17 years after surgery. You're thinking she's disfigured now, but in 1995, at the age of nine, a tumor destroyed her face, and it was crushing her windpipe. She was struggling to breathe. I was amazed at the sense of community. Lots of people were waiting outside the gate and many with problems of their own. But when they saw Ito, they picked her up, put her over, her, over their heads and literally passed her through the crowd, over the gate and into the screen because they recognized that her need was greater. These tumors aren't cancer, they're benign. In fact, it's tooth enamel that won't stop growing. In the U.S., a dentist would remove it before it ever showed, but here, it is understood to be a curse. These are people that go out at night and they forage for food, and then in the day they hide. They can't go to the market. They certainly can't go to school. They are isolated. So these patients arrive, mm -hmm. and they're coming up the gangway. What do you imagine that's like for them? I've seen it happen over and over and over again, that when they are greeted on the ship or when they're greeted at screening and someone comes and shakes their hand, it's like somebody recognizes that I'm inside here. You know, I'm trapped. I can't get away from this tumor, but I'm still in here. And the healing begins when they get acceptance based on who they are, no conditions, just we know you're in there. Fatimata, we know you're in there. And that's what he told a woman named Marta who's been trapped behind a tumor that has been growing for three years. Her husband had banished her from the home. She could die oh, yeah. over time of this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why in 2012 should people be dying 
of benign disease. There are lots of reasons, there are no good reasons, but there are lots of reasons why that's the case. Long tooth forceps, please. So you're going to replace her jaw with a titanium jaw, essentially. That's it, yeah. And then some months later, bone from the hip is taken and put around the titanium, and that grows into new jaw bone. We followed Marta's progress over several months, and in a moment, we'll show you the change. The uniform that's put on people when you have these terrible deformities is you're rubbish, you're worthless, you're spiritually cursed, you're... And when you can change the uniform, it's huge. And the person starts to imagine that they might not be rubbish after all. No one in our world is rubbish. Ido, that first patient that we met who came here as a child, reclaimed her humanity with four surgeries in 17 years. I understand that you're in school. What are you studying? Rocky type trying to be mom. She wants to become a nurse to help other people too. She wants to be a nurse? Yes. She's met a lot of good nurses in her life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And we met a lot of good nurses, too. Do we want to do more than two days of Jen? Or... Ali Chandra is from New Jersey. You know, you could be a nurse anywhere. You could be a nurse back home. I wonder why you do this work. I could never be a nurse back home anymore. I could never go back. There's just this sense of real community that I would really, really miss if I ever left. One of her jobs in this community is to care for the sickest patients. You're all right, baby. You're all right. This is Esther, another one of the tumor patients, as her breathing tube was being removed. Okay. Esther's tumor was massive and her recovery a desperate struggle. Hey, I hear your voice. I hear your voice. You can talk to us. That's so good. Esther could not understand the language, but the touch was unmistakable. Good job, sweetheart. You, you know that there are some people watching this interview who are saying to themselves, I could never do what she does. Those poor <laughs> people are terribly disfigured. Mm -hmm. I can't look at them. People have been saying that to these people their whole lives. And someone has to look at them. Someone has to look them in the eye and tell them that you're human and I recognize that in you. And it's really interesting when, sorry, when new nurses come a lot of the times, they're, they're very shocked and you can tell that this is, you know, I, and you remember that, oh yeah, the first time I saw that, that was kind of shocking, but you, it gets to the point where you don't, you don't see it anymore. You don't see the tumor, you just can see the person's eyes or if they only have one eye because the other one is a tumor. You find their eye and you find a way to connect with them. That personal connection can last for years. A lot of these patients need multiple surgeries, and they'll come back again and again as the ship returns. The idea for all of this set sail back in 1978, when Don Stevens of Texas started a charity that he calls Mercy Ships. So how did you find this ship? We found her in Denmark. She was a rail ferry. Africa Mercy replaced three earlier vessels, and Stephen says that over 35 years, hundreds of thousands of patients have been aboard his ships. Where does the money come from? We've got corporate sponsors that we couldn't do what we do without them. Secondly, by the crew themselves. We have a unique business model. We charge everyone for the privilege of volunteering. And you pay them nothing. Everyone pays their own way. Doctors, nurses, and crew pay their own way with donations from home, mostly from churches. Would it be okay if we pray with you? You're often reminded on board that this is a Christian charity. God, you are good. We pray for your protection over her. And we pray for a complete recovery. A charity that treats patients of any faith. Amen. West Africa is a territory of tribes, and the ship is a tribe unto itself. There's no help out here. Fire on board decks five and six. Is on. The crew drills for every emergency. It is a tight community. Many stay for years. R, which is the rate? They raise their children in the ship's school and return to America on vacation. Ali Chandra's been on board four years and now she's pregnant, but she plans to stay. I wonder, do you think of this as a sacrifice that you're making? No. 
Not at all. Uh, there's things I miss from home. I miss strawberries and I miss fresh milk and I miss my family. Not in that order. You have no idea how awesome this life is. I get to see the world and I get to take care of incredible people and why would you want to live in a house on land? This is way more fun. <laughs> you met your husband here? I did. Yep. I am one of the Mercy Ships romances. <laughs> Not the only one. Are there a lot of those? They call it the love boat. <laughs> yeah. Who calls it the love boat? I don't know a lot of any of us who have found our, our loves here. She found Phil, a ship's electrician. Gary Parker met his wife, Susan, on board, and they've raised Wesley and Karis in a 630 square foot cabin. Susan found out how long they were staying on TV. Somebody had asked him the question, how long do you plan to be here? And Gary looked straight in the camera and he said, I hope for the rest of my life. <laughs> and we looked at each other and <gasps> sucked in our breath. <laughs> and we started a journey of adjusting our expectations from that point. The first time you saw him after you saw the documentary, did you say? Yeah, I did. And he said, you never asked. <laughs> you never asked. The only life the kids have known makes them strangers back home. A couple of years ago, we were in Santa Barbara visiting Gary's mom, and I uh, gave Karis a letter, and I said, would you go down and mail this for me? And she was gone for about 20 minutes, and when she came back, she said, I don't know what a mailbox looks like. <laughs> and I thought, okay, we're in trouble here. <laughs> and today you do not wish you were somewhere else? No. You know, th there's nothing wrong with living at home, but I don't think it's what we're supposed to do. That conviction tends to be renewed with every life that has changed. The quickest change that we saw came in the patients who were the slowest up the gangway. Each step taken on trust. They're blind, cataracts. The surgery takes half an hour, cataract out, new lens in. Some of them had been blind for decades. Now they can see in 24 hours a cause for celebration. The maxillofacial patients are years from healing completely. This was Marta before her jaw was replaced, and this is how she looked after surgery. The tumor is gone, it won't grow back, and when the ship returns, she'll have cosmetic surgery for the scars. Africa Mercy spent five months in this port. 281 tumors removed, 34 cleft palates made whole, and 794 blind patients returned to sight. With that, Africa Mercy threw off her bonds to Togo and steamed for another desperate point on the African coast. The Africa Mercy has just completed another mission, this time in the West African country of Guinea. Its next port of call is the Republic of Congo. On board will be Ali and Phil Chandra, along with their baby girl, Zoe.